and welcome to chapter 16 of tuning in lecture series on stories of asiatic lions by dr ravi challa i am nipunika adiraju coordinator at our sacred space and your host for today our sacred space is a center for folk and classical art environmental work sustainable agriculture sustainable architecture health wellness and inner work it was founded by ms nantara nanda kumar in 2012 in the heart of sikandrabad The place is built using natural materials and the center offers classes, workshops and events in art, dance, music, yoga, theater and performances are also held. We host an organic market called Adiwara Mangadi every Sunday since 2014. Chaura or auditorium was inaugurated in 2016 with a 500 seating capacity. We have hosted several handloom exhibitions, plays, dance and music performances. festivals limb and blood donation camps the telangana heritage center of our sacred space is located in darur vikarabad and was launched in 2017 the heritage center is created to help preserve local agricultural architectural and artisanal practices since its inauguration we have had a number of programs and workshops for the local community we have organized a health camp summer camp music and dance performances film screenings workshops home stays retreats for rural and urban uh, participants at our sacred space darur let me now introduce our speaker for today dr ravi chalam has been in- involved with wildlife research education outreach and conservation since the early 1980s his career includes stints with wildlife institute of india United Nations Development Program Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment Wildlife Conservation Society India Program Madras Crocodile Bank Trust and Foundation for Ecological Security and Greenpeace and many of these in leadership positions he has studied the asiatic lions in gir forest for his phd course and has been involved with the research and conservation of the lions since 1985 This field this includes field research surveys preparing a plan to translocate and establish a second population for free ranging lions in India he has served as an expert scientific advisor to the forest bench of the supreme court of india in 2012 for about a decade he was the research coordinator of wii among the research projects he supervised at wii was the indo us project which looked at the impacts of habitat fragmentation on her heterofauna and small mammals of western ghats he has been involved in governance roles with several ngos including bnhs he has published extensively works closely with the government on policy matters and has given several academic and public talks about more than 400 he is currently the ceo of metastring foundation and director of mission secretariat of the preparatory phase project of the national mission on biodiversity and human wellbeing Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi Chalam, for being our host, speaker for today. I hand it over to you now to take over the talk. Thank you, Nipunika, and uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, let me begin by sharing my screen. Uh, where? Is it visible? Yes, sir. It is okay. Fine. Uh, um, I think I have about forty-five minutes uh, where I will try and outline my engagement uh, with the lions over the last what now fifteen thirty-five years. Uh, give a sense of its ecology and the conservation challenges, and uh, then we can follow that up with a Q and A and discussion uh, session. So the lions did not evolve in India; they evolved in Africa. And so a process of natural dispersal uh, spread through much of the Middle East and then on to India. But today, the lion populations are restricted in Asia to this little patch of forest in Saurashtra, the Gir Forest. Uh, used to have lions right from the Atlas Mountains in the north, uh, all the way uh, down south to uh, the Cape of Good Hope. But today, the lion populations are restricted primarily 
to Central Africa, East Africa, and parts of uh, Southern Africa. Till recently, the lions used to be categorized in several subspecies. Uh, genetic studies have now clearly established that the West and Central African population and the population in and around Gir Forest belong to the same subspecies called Panthera leo, leo. And the East African and South African lion population is the other uh, subspecies called Panthera leo melanochaita. Now, lions amongst large cats are special in many ways, but there are a couple of very distinct uh, features that I would like to highlight. One is that when you look at an adult male lion, even from a distance, it is very clear that is it's a you can't do you can't say that for other cats, uh, be it a leopard or a tiger or a jaguar. So the main ha the male has a nice mane, uh, and the female doesn't have the mane. So even from a distance, you can make out the gender of the animal. This is called sexual dimorphism, uh, and obviously in most human beings also that's very very clear. From a distance, you can make out a male and female. But lions are also special in being the only cat which is social. Uh, here, of course, you see a lioness with a couple of cubs. Here with three younger cubs. And in this case, there's a male, there's a female. But lions societies are not organized like that and they don't function. Unusual picture, rare picture from Gear. But this is what I mean by saying they are social. Here you see at least three, if not four generations of lions living together. A group of lions are called Pride. And Pride are female centric. A bunch of related females form the core of the Pride. They're young, the female especially, then continue to stay on with them and that's how the Pride size grows. This is very, very unusual in cats. No other cat is social. Just a few pictures to give you a sense of uh, the beauty, diversity, both of the forest as well as uh, these animals. I mean, very often we don't get to see them quite in their natural setting. It'll be by the road or it'll be, you know, in some sense set up for our viewing. So I thought I should uh, share a few pictures. Uh, goes back to my field work between 85 and 90 and several are also being contributed my friends. Uh, these are wildlife photographers so the quality of those pictures are also very very good. Here you see a pair of male lines resting in a afternoon. Gear can get very very hot. I have recorded temperatures of up to 47 degrees centigrade in the summer. Uh, going back to where the lion evolved and what was their distribution. This is the Red Sea and this is the African continent. And as I said, the lions evolved in the savannas of East Africa. And through a process of natural dispersal, they moved all the way as far east as Bihar in India. Now, these dots, each of these dots in this map represents a record of a lion, either from a shikar uh, 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 note or from natural history or some, some record is based on which we've reconstructed this distribution. So you can see that Iraq had, Iraq, Iran had quite a lot of lions. Uh, there's the odd line reported from what is today Pakistan, questionable records from what is then USSR uh, and current day Afghanistan. But uh, look at how widely lions were distributed in India. Much of North Central India had Western India had lines. They never went south of the Narmada River, but uh, many, many several uh, modern day states, for instance, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, uh, Haryana, uh, what is today Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, uh, Bihar, uh, all had lines. And the only reason today 
those lions are not there is human beings. Uh, we gained access to firearms. So from early 1800s, um, and the last line outside of uh, Gir uh, in India was recorded in a place called Guna in Madhya Pradesh in 1888. So in barely nine decades, all these lines outside of Saurashtra were decimated. And that's how the distribution of the line got restricted to in and around Gir forest. We don't quite know what happened or why these lines in the rest of Asia became extinct, but there's a record uh, the last record of lions in Asia outside of India goes back to 1947 in a place called Disful, uh, near a place called Disful in Iran. Now we know that we have lions in Africa and Asia. Very often the question that is asked is how can you distinguish uh, what's an Asiatic lion and what's an African lion? It's not easy. There are some cues, but uh, these are not definite. For instance, all Asiatic lines have this flap of skull around their belly uh, called, um, uh, sorry, called a belly fold. Um, but it gets confusing because this belly fold is also found in African lines. But only about 50% of the African lions have their belly fold. So you see the belly fold is universal in Asiatic lions. Not if there is no belly fold, that's definitely an African lion. If there is a belly fold, there's a good chance of it being Asiatic, but it could also be African. The other feature that uh, we can see to distinguish is this wonderful mane. This luxuriant mane is found only in African lines. Uh, you see that in the Asiatic line, you can always see the ears. The top of the head is a little uh, kind of bald. Uh, the mane is not as luxuriant as it's in Africa. So here you see that you can't even see the ears because it's a luxuriant mane. But this is also not universal. Roughly about 50% of African lines have manes like this. 50% have manes very similar to lions. But it is also interesting that there are populations of lions in Africa where the males do not have manes at all. Their body size is big and all of that. There are maneless lions in Africa. It is remarkable that we continue to have lions in India because if you look at what was happening about 140 years ago, they very nearly went extinct. You have records of saying there were less than 12 lines, there were only about 20 lines and so on and so forth. So the fact that lines are still existing in India is a remarkable conservation success, something that we need to celebrate. I don't pay too much attention to the accuracy of these numbers. I think we just need to look at the trend that from a close brush with extinction, the lion population is definitely recovered. And as you would have read in the newspapers, there was a count done uh, earlier this year and the official count today puts the number of lions at 674. So you also find that this yellow bar indicates the, uh, no, the, the pink line indicates the area that they are occupying. You can see that the area that they're occupying is about 30,000 square kilometers that in mind because that's a point of discussion that I will get to. This is Gir Wildlife Sanctuary and National Park. The central dark green of about 200 odd square kilometers has the status of a national park. It is the highest level of protection that Indian law provides. The surrounding light green has the status of a wildlife sanctuary and put together National Park and Wildlife Sanctuary are roughly about 1,500 square kilometers. The shape of the protected area is not ideal. You can see there are narrow chicken necks of protected area extending into human dominated landscape. It's a long and convoluted boundary, which means it increases interface between protected area and human habitat. 
But in India, we go with what we have. I mean, if that's the forest that's left, that's what can we do. Uh, our protected areas aren't quite scientifically designed in that uh, manner. And this is, of course, a fairly old protected area. Um, it's been officially declared uh, uh, under Indian law from about the 1960s, but uh, the Nawabad Junagad uh, had declared uh, it a protected area a long time uh, ago. The other thing that we should note on this map is the number of roads that are going through. There is even, what, two railway tracks going through and also the presence of these reservoirs, which are very important, not just for the ecology of the uh, place, but uh, more importantly, for the surrounding human population, which depends on the water uh, for irrigation and drinking. This is what the forest looks like. It is not your typical savanna grassland mosaic. get fed um, wonderful footage uh, largely from East Africa and Southern Africa and their clients are mostly found in open savanna grassland uh, mix. Deer is actually undulating terrain. It's a series of low hills um, and it's a forest. It's a dry deciduous uh, forest. So bulk of gear is like this. And when you walk into the forest, you can see it's reasonably dense. It's not like The 30%, which is the eastern part of Gir, is a little more open and flatter and more like the African savanna. And this is because there is a change in rainfall. The western and central part of Gir receive about 1,000 millimeters of rainfall. The eastern part of Gir only receives about 650 millimeters of rainfall. Lesser rainfall means less luxuriant. Show you about the rivers and the reservoirs. They're really the lifeline of ecology for this place because bulk of the rain is only during the monsoon, which is from about mid June to uh, late September. And uh, uh, from about January, February, water becomes uh, a scarce resource. Uh, the rivers are, of course, perennial. The reservoir always holds water. So around water, you can see a lot of animal. Uh, activity. The monsoon drives the ecology of gear. So now one of the pictures you've seen of the forest and the habitat would be largely brown and gray and yellow in color. The first rains transforms the habitat magically and you see this vivid and bright green. There's just this tremendous growth flush uh, of grasses and herbs and shrubs and flowers and trees because Remember that these are forest dwelling lines, and this is a wonderful picture of uh, taken by Kalyan Verma under this whole canopy of banyans. Uh, you see a pride of lion crest. Lions and leopards coexist in gear. Leopards are a much smaller cat, an adult male would weigh about 80 kilograms. Adult male lions can Leopards also coexist with tigers. And what makes it possible is the leopard's wonderful ability to climb trees. Leopards are very arboreal, very comfortable in trees. They often take kills up the tree so that lions can't steal it from them. And if they encounter a lion and they don't escape uh, by climbing a tree, uh, lions will catch them and uh, kill them. So they really need to be um, on the alert. Uh, even when they are alert, when they are arboreal, I have seen at least a couple of cases where leopards have been killed uh, by lions. I use the term large cats uh, to describe animals like lions, tigers, leopards, you know, leopards, dogs, leopards, uh, jaguars. There are certain characteristics for these animals. Um, large, by definition, is greater, at least greater than uh, 18 kilograms of body weight. Large cats are... Uh, sir, sorry to interrupt you. You're not audible in between periodically. Okay. Uh, 
better i'll i'll pull out my headphone is it better now yes just one sec is my volume also so large cats are um, large in body size which is 18 kilograms and above um, they are carnivores they will occasionally eat vegetation but that's more to deal with uh, digestive conditions rather than as part of their diet they move a lot they're very wide ranging lion home ranges can range from something like 60 square kilometers to 150 square kilometers in india in certain parts of africa they can be more than 400 square kilometers lions are territorial and by that i mean they will fight uh, to defend their territory and all large cats can roar and amongst large cats lions have justifiably um, the best reputation uh, for uh, roaring they roar regularly uh, and uh, they can male lions can roar sometimes um, from about 6 p.m till about 8 a.m four or five times every hour the magic of wildlife conservation in india is that large dangerous animals and people actually live quite close to each other often with overlap here you see a photograph of Maldaris, the local graziers uh, who live uh, in the Gir uh, Wildlife uh, Sanctuary. And they primarily graze uh, buffaloes, their herds of about 50, 60 animals. And they live in these thorn enclosed settlements, pretty rudimentary, uh, often located close to a water source, both for their consumption as well for their uh, livestock a herd of livestock uh, uh, during summer auto water hole there's actually three herds of uh, livestock there uh, so maldaris benefit from the resources that the forest has to offer and occasionally their livestock is also preyed upon both by lions as well as by leopards very simple very hard working people um, at that point of time in the mid late 80s they did not have access to uh, this is an early morning picture, like four o'clock in the morning. Uh, the women there are churning uh, the curds to uh, produce butter. Their product of commerce those days used to be ghee. I'm now told that uh, they have visited the bus go in and pick up fresh milk. Uh, so they're getting a, a much better market access now. These are the major prey animals. On the left, you see a samba stag. On the top right is a Nilgai bull, and the bottom right are cheetah. There are, of course, several other prey species like wild pigs, uh, Chausinga, Chinkara, porcupines, Manuman langur monkeys, peafowl, and of course, livestock. Lions occasionally even have preyed upon camels and horses and donkeys. So anything that is largish and mobile and has meat. Uh, the carnivore is happy to kill. Gear is characterized by very high density of prey population. Obviously, if you have hundreds of lions and leopards and jackals, uh, you need the prey population to support that carnivore population. And uh, Cheetal is by far the most abundant. Um, during our field studies, we estimated the Sambar is roughly only about three, four thousand animals. Uh, Sambar is more found in the national park uh, than in the eastern part of Gir. It's an animal of more undulating and dense habitat. And the guy is found more open in the eastern part. So that's a herd of Cheeto. This is Sambar stag. Now, what allows the lions to be an efficient? First is the fact that it has those really sharp canine teeth, two in the lower jaw, two in the upper jaw. Without the canine teeth, a large cat cannot kill its prey. 
The other important tool that the lion has are its paws. The four paws are of a size that enables it to grapple with the prey, hold it, bring it down, and then deliver the killing bite. This lion, male, male lion, is a fully fed lion, and you can see from the protruding abdomen and belly there. And lions can feed enormously. They can feed up to 40 kilograms of meat when they are hungry. Lions follow what is called as a feast and famine routine, which means that they don't necessarily eat daily and definitely not three times a day like you and me do. When they get food, they gorge themselves because there's no guarantee when they will get their next meal. I've seen lions go without any substantive feeding bout for up to 12 days. They're extremely efficient feeders. Here is the remains of a cheetal stag. You can see it's been stripped of anything that was edible. And if you look closely, you can see the chewed up antlers also. The, these antlers were in a, what is called as a wet phase, which is the regrowing phase, when it's soft, crunchy, and even those have been fed upon. You can see again from the rest of the carcass, the rib cage, the backbone, the forelimb, uh, the collarbone, and things like that. Completely male lions. I think at about four o'clock in the morning, I was tracking them, so I know this. They went off the road into the bush. There was some noise, and I assumed a kill had been made. I went there about three, three and a half hours later when the sun had come up. And this is what I saw. So this cheetal stag should have weighed something like 50, 60 kilograms, of which about 40 kilograms would have been edible matter. These two males hadn't eaten uh, any substantive meal for about 10 days, and they just polished it off in a couple of hours. Lions obviously do not have cutlery to help them carve the meat. So they have to improvise. And here you see a male lion using his modified molar teeth, which are sharp like knives. Unlike our molar, which are grinding teeth, these modified molars are called carnassial teeth. And they're used to slice the meat off the carcass and then enable the lion to feed upon it. Lions do not chew on their food. They sliced chunks of meat are just swallowed. And here, if you look closely, you can see how the paws are used. So the paws and the carnassials are their knives and forks for them to handle the carcass. Again, here you see a uh, male lion feeding on a chief carcass. And here is a group of lions, two older females and four older cubs feeding on a chief carcass. Now, this is one single female feeding on a nilgai. This nilgai would have weighed anything up to 300 kilograms, a big nilgai bull. And she's a radio collared animal. If you look carefully, you can look at the, you can see the bright uh, dark brown radio color on the neck. This is one of my study animals. And uh, she brought this nilgai bull alone down. And because of the girth of the neck, the lioness was not unable to even deliver the killing bite, either on the throat or on the back of the neck. She adopted a very unique way of killing this animal. She climbed onto the back of the nilgai, bit through the small of the back, which should have paralyzed the animal. I didn't watch the killing. I did, of course, go up and did a postmortem subsequently. So I am able to tell you what I observed. And then she went and bit into the abdomen and this was, I saw, sighted this animal at about 9 a.m. on a May, really hot day. And the Nilgai was then still alive, sitting out in the open. And I found that surprising. Even for a Nilgai, a gear, as I said, can get very hot. And uh, 9, 9 a.m. in a May morning is already touching 40 plus uh, degrees centigrade heat. And I was wondering what was wrong with this Nilgai? Why was it sitting, it out, uh, sitting out in the open in a hot day like this? I observed through a pair of binoculars and then I saw that there was blood com coming out through nostrils and I knew something was wrong, but I was after this lioness. So I left the Nilgai for some time, went and tracked the lioness. I saw her about 100 odd meters away from the Nilgai. She was panting and resting in shade. Her face was covered with blood. 
Then I put one and one, to, uh, one and two together that she had killed this animal and then she's gone to rest in the shade, waiting for it to die. So when I came later, I saw this animal, uh, Neil Guy, fall on its side and die a couple of hours after the initial sighting. Then I could see the injuries and kind of make out what had uh, happened. Why I'm giving you this long explanation is to convey how efficient these animals are. They'll find ways to kill large animals. Um, the lions, unfortunately, have very bad public relations and press in India. They're called lazy lions and people only remember tigers as the symbol of India, forgetting that the first national animal of India was actually the lion. From 1952 to 1972, the national animal of India was the lion. With the launch of the Project Tiger, or just before the launch of the Project Tiger, was when uh, the lions uh, were replaced by the tiger as the national animal of India. Lions, of course, continue to kill livestock. Here is a buffalo carcass in which lions are feeding. Uh, you can't blame them. There are there livestock in the habitat. And as I said, they will kill anything that comes there on the way. The Maldaris in general are very accepting of this loss. They understand the benefits they get uh, from living within the forest. And uh, they don't necessarily um, react negatively. They will, of course, try to protect their livestock, their herd. They don't want to uh, allow the lions to kill it. But once it's been caught, they don't go and disturb the lions. The story is somewhat different outside. Lions, of course, live outside. Um, I'll, later on, I will show you a map that explains it. And lions within the sanctuary and outside the sanctuary are very different species. They have experiences with humans within the forest, uh, they're largely peaceful uh, experiences. Outside, people react negatively, very often stole, uh, throw stones at them and so on. So these lions tend to be much more aggressive. Uh, and I would, when I was doing field work, be much, much more careful uh, trying to approach these animals. I had to do almost all my work on foot. I had a jeep. The jeep was really point-to-point -point transport. Uh, because if you need to go and observe animals, uh, unlike in Africa, we are not allowed to uh, drive off roads. The habitat doesn't allow you to do that. So I had to walk quite a bit. When you're on foot, there's always uh, care that you need to take. Uh, these are uh, dangerous animals. And uh, very often I had at least one person accompanying me because when you're looking through para binoculars or a camera, uh, you don't get to see right around you. So the person, the field assistant's uh, responsibility was to keep an eye, to help me with my work, but more from a security perspective. We talked about lions being social and pride being a group of females. So the males are really not part of the pride, at least not a permanent part of the pride. Prides of females associate with coalitions of males. Coalitions of males can range in size from two to seven. Seven is an unusually large coalition. Typically, coalitions range in size from, no, I mean, most often they range in size from about two to four uh, males. And these males, by definition, would be unrelated to the pride females. And their association with the pride can range anything from two to three years to four to five years. So there is this constant turnover of coalitions uh, associated with prides and we will shortly see what is the logic, what is the ecology that is driving this. Here you see two males uh, sleeping um, and I will draw your attention. I keep talking about the size of those paws. Uh, this animal to the left, you can see how large those four paws are and these are in a retracted state. Uh, as you know, cats can um, expand uh, their paws and when it expands it can grow in size to 40-50% of what you see now and when it expands the claws also come out. So to keep the claws clean and sharp uh, they are able to retract and uh, close their paws. Here is three males. Uh, these were part of a female coalition I was studying. One of these animals was and here there's a pictorial depiction of the changes that you see uh, as the lion comes closer. Cubs are dependent on the pride, not just their mother, maximum till about three years. At the 
age, if not by three, definitely just after three, all male cubs have to disperse, have to leave the pride into which they were born. If they don't get the message, the females, including the mother, will make sure they will behave so aggressively, they will chase these cubs away simply to prevent inbreeding. If the males were to continue to stay, they are attaining sexual maturity, they can then start mating with siblings, cousins, even the mother potentially, aunts and so on and so forth. So ecologically, there is this thing that's been evolved into their social behavior, which ensures that all male cubs, as they become sub and close to adulthood at the age of three, have to disperse from their natal pride, the pride in which they were born. Now this, we don't know what the size of this group dispersing would be. Typically, the sex ratio of a litter of cubs on an average is even, which means if there are 10 cubs born, five would be males and five would be females, but that's on an average. There can be cases where all 10 could be males or all 10 could be females also. And then amongst cubs, the first year is when they have maximum mortality. Up to 50% of the cubs, by natural causes, would die by the time they attain age one. So even if there was an even sex ratio at birth, it is not necessary that mortality ratio would also, mortality would also be uh, even gender based. So we don't know by age three what the gender ratio would be. So there can be two scenarios where there is only one male cub which has survived to be age three. So this will be a single male which will have to disperse. The other scenario could be there will be multiple males and they would reasonably be of the same age, plus minus a few weeks. And when they have to disperse, they will disperse together. So when groups of males disperse together, they have an advantage because there is strength and size. A lone male will find it much more difficult. Obviously, there are other lone males also dispersing. And then as and when the opportunity arises, they will meet and you know there is a process of socialization. If they get along well, then they will establish a coalition while a multiple male dispersal will automatically be in the form of a coalition. After dispersal, this male, male, males spend between a year or two in what is called as a nomadic phase. They do not have territory. They are looking to gain territory. And Resident males which are older, which are injured, which are losing their prowess is what they are looking for. And especially if the, co the dispersing coalition is three or four males and the resident weakening, uh, weakening males are only two, then there is also numbers that work to their advantage. They sense an opportunity. They will aggressively try to take over. There are, of course, chances that they have underestimated the powers of the resident territorial male, in which case uh, they could come off worse, they could get injured, they could even potentially get killed, or that they made the right judgment and they are able to drive the territorial males away. If they succeed, two things can happen. Either they catch hold of the territorial males before they are able to escape, in which case those get killed, or if they are able to oust them uh, uh, without killing them, these males then spend what's called as the second phase of nomadism in their life. This will last maybe a year or two at best. They don't have territory, they've lost their territory. So life for them, and they're getting old and weak, so life for them is getting very difficult. The maximum age that line, male lines survive in the wild is about 12, ranges from about Females survive a little long. So this is a chart that explains what happens uh, in the case of females here. And uh, 
So on birth, till about three, four years, they definitely are in the prime. Most of the females will get integrated. The odd female will prefer to disperse from the natal pride. They are capable of breeding from age three till about age 11. And normally, the maximum life in the wild is about 18 years. So you can see that female cubs have a chance of becoming part of the pride, while very few of them disperse. In the case of males, you, I've already talked at how at about age three, they will have to disperse. Then they form coalitions, they take a year or two, and then they gain strength and experience. They try to establish a territory. And typically they have between two to three years tenure, and then younger males will come around and oust them. And post their ousting, they will uh, so in the case of male cubs, there is no scope for them getting integrated into the natal. The age, as I said, is only about 12 years. Here is a picture of a pair of mating lines. Um, this is a behavior uh, called flemen. Uh, the male is basically assessing the reproductive uh, availability of the female, whether she's cycling and ready to mate with him. When they are mating, Males tend to tag the female very, very closely, protecting a valuable resource. If the male were to hang back, say even 50, 100 meters, there are other males in the ecosystem which will try and take advantage of that opportunity. The mating itself is a fairly prolonged affair. It can last anything from two to seven days. Uh, it's loud, it's aggressive, it's raucous. There's a bit of a tension between the male and the female uh, when all of this happens. And uh, normally the first day is kind of getting to know each other and, you know, kind of settling down. Then the next two, three days is the peak of the mating. And then the final day is also not as so frequent mating. And in the peak of the mating, they are mating three, four times an hour. And they don't normally hunt and feed during this time. And these are all behaviors which are very typical of a mating. And the tension is simply because in this picture, it illustrates it well. You can see the size difference between the male and the female. The male is actually on top of the female. And, uh, theoretically, uh, you can see those young. If he wants one bite of the neck of the female, and he's, he would be able to kill them. So while there is the attraction, there is the need to procreate, there is also this fear and tension. So as soon as uh, he ejaculates, she turns around and actually slaps him uh, and he needs to really get off and run. Uh, so this happens very frequently. It's, it's, it's also funny in a way because at the end of the four or five days, you can find the male's face completely scarred and scratched by all the frequent slaps that he gets. The gestation period for lions is about 110 days. The bulk of the mating takes place in uh, winter, on late winter, early summer. Uh, this is data from my PhD student, Meena Vendapa, uh, uh, quite a bit uh, to this uh, presentation. Uh, but they mate through the year, cubs are also born through the year. Uh, please note that the seasons are uh, mentioned at the bottom. Uh, clearly, three uh, distinct, uh, oops, disable annotation. Lions also resort to what is called as infanticide. Uh, this happens when there's a changeover of males. When fresh males come in, if there are young cubs, they will try their best to kill them. Simply because those cubs were sired by the, old, the former territorial males. And the new males have absolutely no interest in uh, protecting and investing in these cubs because they have no genetic relationship. That is one. The second is young cubs are lactating. I mean, young cubs are suckling and, the, and lactating females are not available for mating. Given that their time, their tenure in a pride is limited, they want to maximize their mating chances. We already talked about how cub mortality is very, very high in the first year. 
on Meena's data for one year, which is all the data we have uh, for infanticide in Asia decline population, is that in 2002-2003, of all the cub deaths that were recorded, 55% was due to infanticide. That's a very, very high number. It's an unusual uh, factor. In fact, uh, maybe several uh, coalitions were being replaced that year. It is not unusual for males to carry injuries like this. This is part of their life because they are actively patrolling and defending and getting into fights all the time. And they have remarkable powers of um, recovery. Uh, human veterinary intervention for this. This is what a lion does, the male lion does most of its uh, waking hours. Walk, patrol, basically protecting the territory of the, in which the pride does reside. And the resource that they are after is of course females. And because tenure is limited, number of females is limited, and they want to maximize, they put in a lot of effort in patrolling, guarding, and defending the territory and thereby the females and their offspring. They advertise their presence by a couple of techniques. One here is roaring. This signal is long distance signal. If it is a quiet day, night in the forest, and it's not very windy, you can often hear a lion roar for four to five kilometers. That's a really long distance. And lions recognize each other roar. So this roar to his fellow coalition partners is a signal saying, hi there, hi friends, I'm here, I'm doing fine, I'm healthy, I'm powerful enough to keep roaring. And it also is a signal to the pride females and young saying, go about your life, you're well protected. But the signal to other potential competing males is, don't come and mess with me. I am here, if you try and mess with me, there will be a price to pay. So this is also a way of advertising and avoiding conflict. But it's short duration. The roar can last about 30, 40, 45 seconds. Um, and lions and gear, typically roar from about an hour before sunset till about two, three hours after sunrise. And they can roar four, five times an hour. And if all the coalition members are together, it's quite a duet or, or whatever you call it, three, four animals roaring. And when you're close by, it's an incredible experience. You, I mean, if you're close enough, you can literally feel the roar. They're really loud, powerful uh, calling noises. The other signal that they have is scent marking. Here you can see very clearly a squirt. This has chemical signals called pheromones. Now this is much longer lasting. They can last depending on climate, uh, where the scent mark is, if it is not exposed to rain, if it's not exposed to sunlight, and days. Now these marks are also unique to the individual. So each line can recognize each other from the scent mark. So you have two complementing signals, the roar, which is a short duration, long distance signal, and the scent mark, which is a long duration, but short distance. Obviously, you'll have to come close up to smell and recognize. So this scent marking is an invisible electric fence, is one way of looking at it, which the lions are constantly marking. So if the dispersing males who have formed a coalition, who are looking to find a territory, find that there are Territories where lions are not roaring regularly, who are not frequently scent marking, they get the clue that the lion, male lions are not very powerful, they are not very strong. If they were powerful and strong, they would be roaring, they would be scent marking. So that's the manner in which they make an assessment as to when to make the challenge. I did the first uh, radio collared study of lions in India. Uh, to the left of this picture is Dr. A.J.T. Johnson, India's first uh, wildlife biologist. And I was his PhD student. And this is me uh, from the 80s. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a picture taken in 1988. A male adult lion with its uh, radio. Uh, we had pretty 
uh, rudimentary equipment uh, to do our work. Uh, nothing to complain about. Eff uh, effective and efficient uh, uh, ways we did our work. This was my field crew and my colleague in the peak cap, Dr. Jamal, uh, who studied the ungulate population, the deer population, while I was. Once you put the radio collars, it is your utmost responsibility to go out and track these animals. The radio signals get absorbed by vegetation and by terrain. You already have seen that gear is a hilly habit. So to maximize my ability to detect the radio collared animals, I had to keep climbing hills on a regular basis. So the collar is on the line. I'm carrying a receiver, which is connected to a directional antenna. So I would do a sweep, a 300 degree, uh, a 360 degree sweep to find out whether there were any signals, once I caught some signals, I would narrow down the angle and using a compass then determine in which direction I will need to go to find these animals. This is again Mina's data. So based on that, you can start plotting the locations and based on a series of locations, you can start marking home ranges. And in this case, you have an animal which was born in this area, which is called natal territory in 2001 and then it dispersed it first settled down here then it'll settle down and then it moved so it is still trying to find a permanent territory and this is the case with another individual uh, you have 302 locations based on which you're able to draw this home range uh, which is 174 square so it's a fairly significant uh, area now switching to distribution of lions, conservation issues from ecology. So gear to the left, you see the gear protected area, but lions are found all over this habitat. Now this is Junagad, Porbandar. These are large towns and cities, Bhavnagar, Veraval on the coast, and a little further north is Rajkot and Jamnagar. But lions are there. How are they managing? They are managing by living in really small patches of forest where they spend the night. This is primarily agriculture and developed uh, matrix of habitat. And during the night, they are going out and primarily killing livestock to live. And this is official data uh, from about five, six years ago. You can see that about 304 lines are within the protected area. But look at the number of lines outside. In this location, about 80. In this location, about 33, 37 here, 18 here, and 32. So there is this uh, more or less unbelievable situation where large, dangerous cats are living with people. Uh, I haven't, uh, I'm not planning to show videos, but I have hundreds of videos now of lions encountering state transport buses, somebody on a motorbike encountering lions, and so on and so forth. There's a still picture you can see here is a lion is sleeping on a village road, and you can see two villagers in the background on their motorbikes. Here's a lion navigating a railway track. This is of course within the protected area. There are lions having to deal with highways and uh, rail lines outside much more. It's not unusual for uh, one or two lions to get, unfortunately, killed by trains and trucks on an annual basis. But a more uh, bigger cause of death is lions getting uh, electrocuted, lions falling into open wells, and occasionally lions getting poisoned. Now, there are some simple questions I often pose because very often, uh, many of us have very differing views on conservation. Some of us are very focused on the fate of individual animals. While I would argue that conservation is not really about individual animals, it's really about populations and persistence of populations. For populations of species to persist, they need habitats. We cannot continue to fragment and degrade and destroy habitats and expect populations of animals to uh, survive. So conservation is really about ensuring integrity of habitats, 
to allow populations to persist and flourish. The other question is, what kind of time frames? Do we do conservation on a day-to-day -day basis, on an annual basis, on a five-year time frame? What time frame should we be working? If conservation is really about ecological process and evolution, it really has to be very, very long time frames, much beyond even human lifespan. But that is difficult for us to imagine and plan. But to plan anything less than a five-year time frame is not prudent at all. Conservation is not just about wildlife and wild habitats, because in India especially, we have already seen how lions coexist with people. And we have to ensure rights, justice, inclusiveness are very much part of our conservation agenda, because that's the only way it will sustain over the long term. Are there costs to conservation? When I talk of costs, I'm not talking of financial costs. Human costs. Clearly, there are human costs. The conservation agenda is driven by what I would call the urban elite, the government, and so on. And the costs are disproportionately borne by local communities who are often in a much less power or even from an economically poorer uh, background. So these are questions I would urge all of us to think about when we engage with conservation. My final section, see lions, as we saw evolved in Africa through a natural process of dispersal, um, something like 30 years, 20, 30,000 years ago, came into Asia. There have been a distinct genetic population, at least from about 10 to 10. They're very unique animals. But lions had very wide distribution. They were present in multiple populations. The fact that there's a single lion population left in Asia, while, as I said, we have managed to stave off uh, extinction is a considerable conservation achievement. It is also a huge conservation risk. It's a case of having all your eggs in one basket which is why I was commissioned by the Wildlife Institute of India in 1985 to go and study the ecology of these animals, to arm ourselves with information, which will allow us to explore the possibility of translocation to establish a second free ranging wild population of lions. So I did my field studies 85 to 90, and in 93 and 94, uh, I formed a small team of four of us. We did a survey of three sites to assess their suitability for line translocation. And the site that we chose is this Kuno Wildlife Sanctuary, which is in western, northwestern Madhya Pradesh, bordering Rajasthan. And it takes its name from this wonderful perennial river called Kuno, which is a major tributary of the Chambal River. Very diverse habitat, lush bamboo, very productive grasslands, uh, in the early 90s, it also had challenges with overgrazing, human presence, and so on. So we provided a recommendation in 1995 that was accepted by Government of India, and they started managing, it was funding the Madhya Pradesh Forest Department to manage Kono and prepare it for translocation. The Madhya Pradesh, I'm happy to say, has done a very good job, but unfortunately, till date, line translocation itself hasn't happened. In 2012, a public spirited citizen went to the Supreme Court and filed a PIL asking why lines have not been translocated when the Kuno is ready, when 1,200 families have been relocated, uh, when crores of rupees have been spent in managing Kuno and preparing it for line translocation. The Supreme Court gave its order uh, on 15th of April 2013. It very clearly ordered the translocation of lions to Kuno within six months. So 15th of April, six months is 15th of October, 2013. As I said, we are now towards the end of 2020, well past seven years, and there is no sign of lions being translocated. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail, but uh, anybody interested can email me. I'll be happy to share the judgment. It's worth reading it. It is very well argued. It is based on constitution of India. And uh, 
it was based on official policy, government policy. The then National Wildlife Action Plan had land translocation. It makes some fundamentally profound observations. It, for instance, this is an exact quote from the judgment. No state, organization, or person can claim ownership or possession over wildlife. This was in response to Gujarat saying, these are our lions, uh, we cannot let go of lions. Uh, animals in the wild are properties of the nation for which no state can claim ownership. And the state's duty is to protect the wildlife and conserve it for ensuring the ecological and environmental security of the country. So, you know, especially in the post-pandemic world, these are words that we need to really pay heed to. Is the frame of reference the judgment says the only criteria for preservation of an endangered species should be what is best for the species all of the considerations should be set aside and unfortunately that is not being paid uh, attention to and taken on board what is today's situation the judgment ordered the setting of an expert committee which was done three four months after the judgment i am a member of that committee Kuno is definitely ready. 24 villages have been relocated. 15, more than 1,500 families have been relocated. Independent assessment of the prey base and management capacity testify for the fact that Kuno is ready. 2016, another public spirited citizen filed a contempt petition saying 2013, the court ordered the translocation. It's 2016 now. Still, lines haven't been translocated. The court only heard this in 2017 and in March 2018 dismissed the petition saying that the government has assured us they will take action. Now it's well over two years since that. We are in a stalemate. Lines have not been translocated. In the meantime, the risks have come to play. There have been very, very pronounced mortalities of lions. The dreaded canine distemper virus and babesiosis combination has been uh, it's both one is an amoebic disease and the other is a viral disease and they are lethal in 1994 uh, in the Serengeti Mara ecosystem uh, a thousand lions died in three weeks and we can't afford that kind of mortality in India so the need for translocation is very very clear the law on this is very very clear but the government continues to drag its feet just last few slides to convey the current conservation challenges and opportunities that we have in India. This is a photograph of a leopard jumping from the terrace of an engineering college in Tumkur. This is one of a leopard bludgeoned to death uh, somewhere in the northeast. Here you see a dead leopard again in Karnataka. Ireland did, and you can also see an old woman uh, more or less praying and paying obeisance to it. This, in some sense, these three pictures give us a reasonably diverse view on how Indians are interacting with wildlife today. We, in our desire to develop, are extending our presence and built habitats well into wilderness habitats, wherever. Uh, wild animals populations are thriving then you find some of that engaging with human beings on a regular basis some of it ends very badly for the animal like the last two pictures but still people have a certain reverence as per official numbers 50 percent of the lions 50 percent of the tigers and more than 50 percent of elephants and leopards in this country are not within our protected areas. They are in human dominated habitats. So it is not as if humans are not tolerant and it's really that tolerance that's allowed India to build this fairly good track record in conservation. Last three or four slides. This is my first photograph of a line. December of 1985, I grew up in Madras. Um, I studied Hindi in school, but my Hindi even today is not very great. And then I went to, um, Gujarat in uh, Gir in 1985, December, uh, I knew next to nothing Gujarati. Even anyway, spoken language there is Katiyavadi, which is a local dialect. So when I went out uh, for four days, trying to find out how I can set up my field base, what kind of re uh, research methods would be appropriate, 
I had a young boy of about 15 years from the local village uh, with me. We roamed about all the four days. I saw lion tracks. I, lo I saw lion droppings. I heard lions at night. I saw their kill remains, but I hadn't sighted a single lion. And I was beginning to get worried. I'd quit a marketing job to get uh, into this, and I'd chosen lion ecology for my PhD. If one doesn't sight the animal, how is one supposed to study that? So last evening we were walking on the road when from about 50, 60 meters uh, up ahead of me, suddenly from the bush emerged four lionesses. And I'm not ashamed to say I was scared. This is the first time I was seeing large cats on foot at such close proximity. I kind of in my broken Hindi asked the boy, what should we do? And he basically gestured and said, just stay, put nothing will happen. So I held my breath and stood still. These lines kept coming. And uh, by the time I realized I actually should be using my camera binoculars, three of them had disappeared into the bush. And uh, this is one picture I got, and I'm quite proud of it. it. Took me about six months to do this. You can see me in the picture with uh, three lions in the photo. The only reason why I had to do this was to be able to identify individual lions. When you do a long-term study, you need to identify and follow lions for long time. Of course, later on, I had radio collars, but I had only eight radio collared animals. What I was able to recognize during my field work up to 60 or the way you recognize lions is by looking at their viscous spot. Uh, in tigers and leopards, you have body patterns which are unique. In lions, obviously, the body does not have any uh, stripe or spots. So it's the viscous spot pattern. The viscous spots are arranged in three or four rows. And if you get a good fix on it, uh, these are unique, like, like a fingerprint. And you can identify these individuals. If you are at a distance, given the dense vegetation, even the best pair of binoculars and telescope would not allow you to be able to do that. That was the reason I had to find ways of getting up to them. Then, of course, I was young and uh, there's always the thrill of uh, being uh, close to these animals. Here you can see actually my own shadow. It's a wide angle shot of a male lion sleeping, but my shadow is also captured. That gives you a sense of how close I was. Here is a subadult male sleeping on a hot summer evening. I took this picture. And look at the reaction of the animal of curiosity, not of aggression. This is to just convey the fact that these lions are very, very special. They are wild. They are not domesticated. They are not friendly to humans. But at the same time, they are also not waiting to attack and kill every human being they see. Especially given that 50% of the lions are not even within the protected area. Uh, it's something that we need to keep in mind. The manner in which these lions behave. Of course, every year, dozens of people are injured. A few of them die. But that is only bound to happen given the frequency of interaction uh, between lions and people. None of us think twice about taking a bus or driving our cars or walking on a road. Uh, and if you look at our road accident statistics, uh, you know, we shouldn't actually be doing that. This is just to give you a comparison and not to uh, frighten you uh, from uh, observing animals. Of course, no tourist would be allowed to walk uh, with lions. I had special permission as a long-term field researcher. This is again an illustration of the challenge we face with conservation in India. This is the Gir National Park. This is the only po uh, population of lions but these lines also have to handle take transport bus, uh, you know, going through. As I said, I've given dozens of talks. I never tire of talking about lines, sharing some of my experience and hopefully inculcating some knowledge and interest um, about these animals because I strongly feel more Indians take interest, more Indians engage with these animals, engage with the conservation questions around these animals. Um, then it will be a road to success and not If transportation does not happen, we are ending fate sooner rather than later. A natural catastrophe or a political decision can spell the death knell for these animals. I was focused on lions, but Gear is a wonderful place to visit. If you've not had the chance, please do. 
amongst the highlights of my four, four and a half years of stay there was the most lovely sunrises. Thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge the following uh, for various contributions to my research as well as for this presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. I request everybody to uh, leave their questions in the chat box. You can potentially even turn on their videos. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I just noticed the chat. There has been an issue with the audio. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Mm. It was fine it in between, be. but initially and uh, during the end, uh, half the sentences were breaking. But that might be a quality of my internet rather than anything else. Yeah. Anyway. I don't see any questions though. Yeah. Uh, there's a question on Facebook. Uh, do tribals play any role in in the lion population of the forest? Do tribals play any role? In the lion population of the forest, do they have any interaction with them? Oh, all the time. I mean, the, these are the Maldaris. I told you they graze livestock in the forest and uh, they do lose livestock. So their livestock forms part of the lion diet. But the Maldaris themselves interact very, very positively and uh, peacefully both with the environment and the lions. Uh, they do defend their livestock, but uh, do not take any negative action against the lions. And uh, in many ways, they also then become the eyes and ears of uh, the forest department because they are living 24 seven in the forest. Good evening, Dr. Chalam. Um, I have a question. Uh, what would you recommend for urban youth who are interested in conservation? Yes, once again, Nantara, I have an ecology question here. Do animals get any dangerous diseases? I don't know what a dangerous disease is, but animals get all kinds of diseases. Uh, and I talked about canine distemper virus, babesiosis, uh, uh, anthrax, rabies, all of these. Uh, are very, uh, can prove to be very fatal uh, for animals and some of them for human beings also. Uh, and uh, it depends on the species, uh, if it's a deer, if it's an antelope, some of them are shared across species, but uh, certain diseases are unique to uh, certain species. Uh, in terms of the urban youth question, my approach is we have to consider ourselves as part of the environment and part of nature rather than us human beings and then nature being something external to us. If that attitudinal change can be made, I think it will change many things fundamentally. Then our approach towards nature would be gentler, kinder, uh, more empathetic. Uh, currently, there is ignorance and linked to that ignorance, I think there is a certain fear of nature and wildlife. I mean, uh, to even characterize, uh, I mean, in general, when we call something wild, we have a negative connotation to it. Uh, you know, in human, oh, that guy is a wild guy. is not a compliment. Uh, so, we somehow have uh, brought that kind of vocabulary, uh, forgetting that we are also very much part of nature. Let's look at it very practically from an environmental sense. We breathe the same oxygen that animals and plants breathe. We use the same water that animals, I mean, it's only how we access it. We turn a tap and so on and so forth, but uh, they find their own ways. And water and air and oxygen and carbon dioxide and other nutrients like phosphates and nitrates 
there's a global geochemical cycling that's taking place. It's not run by human beings. We don't run a global water filtration or oxygen producing uh, factory. It's nature. It is, it is a natural process. If we are so dependent on nature and our evolutionary origins from the great apes, uh, you know, if so, uh, that, that, that attitudinal shift is really, really critical. Unless that happens, our relationship with nature will always be fraught. The other thing is our ecological footprint, our carbon footprint, which basically our life, our lifestyle, our consumption, what impact it's having on nature and what impact it's ha having on uh, the environment. And today, I hope nobody is a climate change denier and climate change is completely caused by our lifestyle. So conscious decisions, cut back on consumption, completely eliminate waste, try and recycle every single thing, you know, including our garbage, segregation of garbage. How do we recycle? And India is great. There's always people willing to take your garbage as long as you segregate it and do it. Yes, there is also thrill in going and visiting wildlife sanctuaries, photographing wildlife and all of that. But that is only, only after these kind of fundamental changes and value inculcation that you have to take. I'm not against that. I, I, I've shown you pictures, I've shown you, hopefully conveyed the excitement and thrill that I had when I was doing my field work. All that is good. But that should be built on a foundation of ecological responsibility. I hope, I mean, it's a long winded answer, but I hope it made sense. Uh, so there's another question on Facebook. Uh, you mentioned about all eggs in one basket conservational practice during your talk. Can you please elaborate on that? Oh, yes. We talked about how the entire Asiatic lion population is restricted to gear and its surrounding habitats. So though each lion is an egg, look at it that way. And look at Saurashtra as your basket. So the Saurashtra basket has all the surviving wild lions of Asia. Now, if that basket drops, however big it might be, and however high the number of eggs would be, there's a fairly good chance all your eggs would break. In, in more real lion terms, for instance, this disease, if it spreads through the population, you will suffer enormous mortality, which will set back our conservation by decades. I told you how in Serengeti, a thousand lions died in three weeks. And our total lion population is less than thousand of which 50% is not even within a protected area. So by translocating, by establishing at least one, if not more additional populations, you are buying life insurance for wild lions of Asia. All of us buy life insurance for us, for our family, not because we think we're going to die tomorrow, but in the event of a tragedy, this becomes your safety net. Similarly, a second, a third, a fourth free-ranging population of lions is buying life insurance, is not allowing all your eggs to be in one basket. Nipunika, I see Nikhil Nikita's question. Yeah. Uh, I just want to know about any volunteering or intern opportunities. Uh, I will, I have of course uh, sent my email, I mean put my email in uh, my presentation, I will type it here. Uh, it's best that uh, those who are interested uh, write to me with these kind of questions because it, it will take some time to really uh, answer them. I'm, I'm just sending my email on chat. So, Nikita, please write to me. Yeah, those are the questions we have, sir. Okay. Um, I would like to invite Ms. Nantara Namukumar, our founder of uh, Our Sacred Space, to give the vote of thanks. So I'm really grateful to you for sharing a lifetime of research with us today. And I hope um, that your talk will affect 
each of us in our responsibility towards conservation. And uh, you have really made us understand, though, you know, we've all uh, visited the national parks and um, read about lions. I think we've understood much deeper about the social, um, you know, structures of the lion uh, communities and um, this, the photographs really spoke volumes and um, I am really grateful for you, to you for sharing today and I know that the, this talk will inform many, many more people um, over the years. Thank you, Dr. Shalom. And Thank I hope you will Thank you for the opportunity. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you. Same to you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Good night.